Hello, everybody. My name is Sean Jakes, and I'm going to just kick this off, and I'm going to turn it over to our two experts here that are going to take us through this uh, this this um, topic. So this topic is a little bit about uh, thought leadership and how um, it's a good idea to follow some of the design principles that you use in coding and apply those to how you structure your tests. But then we're also going to transition into some of the new features or an a new particular feature called auto grouping that Testum has launched that helps uh, eliminate some of the duplication that that often creeps up in end-to-end -end tests and allows you then to create um, more maintainable tests through um, auto groups. So um, without too much delay, I'm going to introduce you. First of all, Benji is going to uh, take us through these 10 tips on how to apply some coding concepts into designing your tests. Let Benji introduce himself, or Benji introduce himself, and uh, and then once uh, Benji gets through his session, then Paz will come in and introduce himself and, and take us through there. If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat and we'll get to them as we can. Uh, sometimes we can do those um, as we're, uh, as we're presenting, we, somebody can reply to the chat or we might have to address those at the end, but there will be time for questions at the end as well. So without um, any more delay, I'll introduce you to Benji. Oh, so, hey everyone, uh, Winston, I need to uh, present. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, can you give me like the, the presenter uh, control or how does it work? Okay, uh, show my screen. Yes, this is good. Uh, I won't start with code, but I'll have code. I just wanted to do the slides. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Benji. Uh, I'm a team lead at uh, Testim.io. Uh, I also do a bunch of open source stuff. I work on uh, Node.js. Uh, I teach high school once a week, uh, not so much in COVID. Now it's online, less fun. Uh, I help organize a meetup here in Israel. I speak in conferences from time to time, and I'm on GitHub and Stack Overflow. Uh, check us out. Uh, check me out. Awesome. So today we're going to talk about authoring maintainable tests. And there's a few takeaways I want you to have from uh, this talk. I will be asking you uh, questions during the talk. Uh, if you have any questions in the meantime, um, please feel free to like ask them in chat and I will address them now or uh, when there is a good time to pause. All right, so uh, when we polled a lot of companies uh, regarding whether or not they had end-to-end -end tests, we found out the vast majority don't run end-to-end -end tests in part of their development cycle. And this makes me very, very sad uh, because I know how important having end-to-end -end tests and like in particular good end-to-end -end tests is to a, a good, like nice development cycle. And it also makes me very, very uh, confused uh, because there is this something that we know saves a lot of time and a lot of money in every like development cycle and like the vast majority of people aren't doing it so why uh and I, I think like a big part of it is that software and tests in theory are this neat organized thing where you we know where we are going and we know where we are but in practice software is this very chaotic thing where uh a lot of all things are moving like uh around and we need to keep up and, and like it's it's very messy so uh i'm gonna start with a poll question what is the most important uh skill for testers i'll give you like 15 20 seconds to answer this is cool i i didn't actually know the polls have their had their own uis here so <laughs> learn something new every day <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, did everyone uh, vote? Did anyone vote? Are people voting? Uh, I can't tell. He, um... We're going to close the poll right now. And here are the results. Okay, cool. Do we have results? Oh, cool. So test strategy, interesting. All right, uh, awesome. Um, can I present again? I don't know how to do that. Uh, can people see my screen or are they seeing the poll? They'll see in the poll results. Okay, cool. 
So uh, when, when testing did a poll for this, uh, the output was that uh, indeed uh, a lot of participants, 87%, uh, sorry, 57% said it's uh, test design and architecture. So it's important and it's like real software. So uh, the number one takeaway uh, is that tests are software. Uh, the reason most test automation projects that fail fail is because it's not treated seriously enough and it's not treated like regular software. Uh, don't do things in test code that you wouldn't do in other code. So uh, I'll, I'll just jump to code real quick. Uh, so these are tests using uh, Justin Puppeteer. And uh, like a lot of them are using uh, patterns that uh, you see in code. Uh, and I, I want to just explore like certain things you do, you would and wouldn't do in code. So certain things are just messy. Like we know that having like global variables in test files that like uh, change between tests, uh, sorry, uh, some bar, some state uh, is, is messy. Uh, we know that like having confusing naming is messy. Uh, we know that not uh, like putting everything in, in one file is messy. And the, like in, in my opinion, uh, and from what I've seen, a lot of people feel more comfortable writing like very shoddy code in their tests, but not in their regular code. So the first takeaway is that tests are regular software. Don't treat tests uh, differently from regular software. It's just as hard as authoring any other type of code. Uh, uh, I, I write like uh, tests and I write uh, front-end code and I write back-end code uh, and I write mobile code. It, it's really not all that different. The test projects, they grow big, uh, just like other code bases. And if you don't treat them uh, with as much uh, seriousness, then like, they, they won't survive just like any other uh, software project. And again, this isn't uh, unique to tests. Uh, you need to uh, think about the uh, type of code you write. Uh, the second thing about end-to-end -end tests is that tests should run on CI and block releases. Uh, the reason it's important to test run on CI is because tests degrade over time. Uh, I'm assuming like some of you at least don't use something like testing that does like healing of tests between runs. But if you don't run your tests very frequently and you don't see them immediately uh, when they fail, then in, like, eventually you will stop running them uh, and stop taking them as seriously. Tests need to block releases somewhere. It, they don't have to run on every uh, pull request. They don't have to run on, on every uh, like um, commit, but they have to run on every release. And you need to be sure that the tests provide meaningful results. Uh, tests and alerts and everything that has to do with monitoring. Once it gets ignored, it gets ignored. Uh, so the, the moment you, like if you're studying a test uh, automation project, strive as quickly as possible to connect it to your CI server. If you don't have a CI server, it's very easy to set one up with something like GitHub Actions uh, or Circle CI. Uh, even like set, setting up Jenkins is pretty easy. If you just need to run the test and not do anything else that's uh, very complicated, uh, and tests should run on CI. There's interesting questions here, like uh, what environments and what about the backend. Uh, but at least the the most basic tests, uh, like the the we call them sanity. I don't like the name, but like the the smoke tests need to run uh, on every version. Um, just like in regular code, and again, this is this relates to point number one, where tests are software. It's very important to not have the same logic a hundred times. So let's say you have uh, let's let's look back at the puppeteer tests uh, I have here. Uh, so you, you see this code, it's very hard to see uh, what it does. And if it repeats just one time in my test, that's fine. Like if this is the only only time in history that uh, those that sequence of lines of code uh, exists in my test, it's it's not that bad. Uh, I, I won't tell you to like, uh, um, actually we'll, we'll touch on that, uh, but if you have something that repeats more than one or two times, definitely extract it to a function. Uh, the main reason for that is that, as you see, all these tests have CSS selectors. CSS selectors break from time to time, especially when there's big changes. Uh, so you definitely want to have uh, like an easy way to change a lot of CSS selectors and logic groups uh, quickly uh, in uh, like, the most common case in automation is a pattern called a page object where you just have an object containing uh, common methods. Uh, so this test right here uh, can uh, be this test, like these two tests are identical. This test has a lot of commands. This test has the same commands. It's not inherently simpler. If you do the login 
Uh, like if you run the login action just one time in your app, you don't have to put it in a page object, but if it repeats more than once, putting it in an object and not repeating yourself, uh, it's also often called the rule of three because once you repeat yourself three times, you have to extract it. You, you, you don't have to, but you should. Uh, then consider putting things in neat page objects. And a very similar pattern is uh, like component objects where it's it's not a page, but just like the form containing it. So it's easier to use uh, between uh, pages. Uh, but really, every different logic, it's not that every line should repeat itself only once in your code, but every uh, distinct logical action you perform, like logging in, should be only once in your code. Uh, and again, this isn't specific to tests. It's just something we see uh, recurring over and over in poorly architected uh, test projects. So I will repeat it. Uh, let's uh, uh, next poll question. Uh, do you reuse components uh, or, or like pages across your uh, tests? Okay, we have uh, a lot of uh, yes sometimes and a few uh, yes all the time. So that, that, that's pretty good. It, this is very important to do. It's one of the main reasons we see uh, like uh, tests uh, break and like, so it's not the main reason we see tests break, but it's a very common reason we see uh, for tests breaking and the time to repair being higher than it has to be. All right, I think we can continue. Let me, uh, let me ask you a quick uh, question. Um, sometimes I've seen on the web where there's guidance that says it's okay to have repetition in testing as long as it helps add, um, you know, visual clarity to the test, right? It helps with understandability of the test. What, what would you say about, um, you know, duplication or balancing duplication of code in your test versus the, the need for understandability? So uh, it's a good question. I think that it's kind of the same in tests and, and other software, just like it, going back to the point that test the regular software, uh sometimes repeating yourself uh is fine like if you have the same two three actions uh repeating them a few times isn't isn't that bad but if you have like the same set of actions like like a login group in a web web app uh, repeating a hundred times that's that's like the other other extreme uh just like software it's it's an equal amount of like art and engineering you don't have like a and, and, and like another complicating factor is people's minds works differently. Code that's clear to one person is, is very hard to another. Uh, so I, I, I would stick to like not reinventing like the when you when you separate things out. And if you're not sure, if you have something that repeats more than three times, I would put it in its own uh, like component or, or, or page. And if it repeats less than three times, I would very rarely put it there unless it adds a lot of clarity. Uh, and, and of course, there are exceptions to the rule. If it's like the same one line, uh, don't put every one line in a function, inside a function, inside a function, yada, yada. Uh, uh, so for functions have two, uh, like in classes, have uh, two main purposes. Uh, readability is only one of them. Uh, so like, uh, use, use judgments. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. Number four, oh, sorry. <laughs> I just said that's good advice. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, so and number four actually relates to this. Uh, it's it's Yagni. It's the opposite of, of don't repeat yourself. It's basically don't prepare for architecture that's never going to happen. Uh, we've all seen this. Uh, there's like a project and someone says, hey, maybe we'll add translation to German uh, next year. So you have all these like layers of indirection uh, between your code and your, your test code, right? So let's say uh, maybe I am writing this uh, this code, and I say, hey, uh, this is the I, I log in here, so uh, this is gonna repeat itself. So I'm gonna put it in a page object. So you go and you make your page object, uh, yada yada, uh, class account, and you have your login method, and you say, hmm, I am not sure. Like uh, the selectors are always gonna be the same. Maybe in a year we'll have like. Uh, localization and we'll have like um, um, different translations so instead of having like the css selectors right here we can have a config file so we can do a const config and let's do a let's make it a class so it's easier so class config 
um, to do new. So it creates an instance. And you can put it here. And, and now uh, this class can just uh, do this. It needs to have a constructor. And that constructor can do uh, this dot config equals config, or it will get it from like dependency injection, uh, which again has all these things have use cases. Now this has to become this dot config dot login button. So uh, like this sort of thing supports uh, like additional use cases. Like for example, if I wanted the selectors to be differently across different localizations. And I can take this a step further and read like a different config from like an external JSON file. And I can take this a, straight, a step further and read a config from a database. And there are uh, like advantages to this in, 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 in principle. Uh, if, if the selectors were in the database and the test broke, I could change the database. But what I'm doing is I'm adding layers of abstraction that I might not need. And everything in the code is just a tiny bit harder. Like this code is harder than uh, this code, the code I had before the config uh, separation. And this code in turn, this class account is harder than the code I had before I had a page object, right? This code is the simplest because everything is here in line. And here I have to go to a separate file and I need to do the matching between this selector and this place and step with the debugger. So uh, there are cases where you want to separate it. Uh, you need to uh, separate things into reusable components, but not too soon uh, because the, the extra layers of abstraction are expensive and often uh, you won't actually use them. Uh, the, the good thing about test code is you have tests, right? So if you refactor or change your test code and, and, and it fails, uh, the tests are failing, which is good. It's what you aspire for in every other type of software. Uh, so th there is really no reason to like plan ahead too much to features that may or may not happen. It's better to add coverage and improve your existing tests and not plan for a future that may not come. Uh, and this is also a, a reason that a, a lot of test projects fail because they start uh, making architecture decisions too early uh, before the actual use cases uh, for the tests you have to write happen, and you end up writing a lot of boilerplate code you, you don't have to uh, use, and that just slows you down a tiny bit in everything you do uh, afterwards. Uh, um, number five is tests should have as little state as possible. And what, what this means is if you have a test that logs a user in and then like sets some state in your system, uh, you don't want other tests to rely on it, ideally. And I know it's an ideal. It's not something that you always get. Every test should live in its own isolated environment and tests shouldn't share state. So if, if I want, like a test wants to uh, uh, get a system in a certain state, like every good test, it has three uh, parts. Some of what, like one of them is the setup. Uh, it needs to set up this, the system to be in a consistent state where the test can uh, assert whatever it needs to assert. And then it needs to go down and other states needs like tests needs to be unaware of that. Uh, the reason is twofold. First, uh, debugging tests that rely on things that happened in other tests is very hard and very tricky. Uh, this means that uh, like debugging tests is very hard uh, to begin with. Doing this when tests like change each other is, is, is close to impossible. And the thing is when one test starts failing, like the other tests often start failing and it, it just makes a cascading mess. Uh, the other reason uh, that you want to put as little state as possible in tests is that uh, running tests in parallel on grids is impossible if they share state uh, or, or at least very hard when they share state. At some point, you will want to run your tests on several browsers and like often on several or new or different instances of your staging environment. Uh, if the test shares state, that's very hard uh, or impossible to do. Uh, it also makes cleanup easier, uh, which we may discuss uh, soon. All right. Uh, number six, perform cleanup at the start of the test and not the end. Right. Uh, so going to number five, uh, tests uh, need to keep a little state, but uh, fact of life, tests will often have state. Often, like setting up your whole environment from scratch uh, with Docker is uh, not. Uh, feasible uh, for every test. It's prohibitively slow. It can take several minutes. Uh, in some cases, it, it, it doesn't. It, it can take like a second, then it's fine. Uh, if it takes uh, too, too long, you're working on an enterprise system, uh, it's not feasible, then 
you will have to do cleanup. It's very tempting initially to write tests like this. Uh, I'll go back to the code. It's very tempting. Let's say this test does a login. Uh, the thing missing here is the logout, right? It's very tempting to do a const account equals new account, account.login. I'll, I'll make this a bit bigger, uh, account.login. And then uh, I, I'll do like uh, do the assertion and then do await accounts.logout. Uh, and this cleans up the state inside this like test sort of. The problem is, is if this expectation fails, the cleanup doesn't run. So you'll say, hey, um, I am a, I'm a clever individual. I read docs. I know JavaScript has a keyword called finally. And if I do try here, and then I do uh, finally here, even if the expectation fails, the cleanup will run. The problem is, what if for some reason, the browser decided to become stuck or irresponsive when this ran? or during like the end of the login after the password was set. Uh, so it's very, or, or just like the, the CI decided that your tests have been running for too long and decides to kill the machine or like a million other reasons uh, why this finally block doesn't actually have to run. Uh, this is pervasive, like it, it's not just for uh, tests. It's, it's a, like a problem in systems in general. Cleanup is very hard uh, and cleanup is best effort. So. Whenever you write a cleanup that's, that runs in, um, in test code, you, it's, it's always a, a good practice to assume that it may or may not run and running it is best effort, right? Like 900 out of like 901 times it will run. The problem is in test code, the tests run a lot. So even one false um, like positive gives you a lack of confidence in your tests. And it's just like churn, you really don't want to run in this. So what you should do instead, is instead of putting this cleanup here, you, you need to run the cleanup in a way that's idempotent, which means if it runs multiple times, it's fine. It doesn't like cause any issues uh, to the page. Uh, so for example, in account dot, uh, let, let's write our logout. So uh, logout uh, and what it's gonna do, uh, I think in this website, like the um, uh, login is in local storage. So I'm gonna do page dot evaluate uh, local storage dot clear. And the thing is, if I run clear multiple times, it's fine. Like it's gonna clear local storage several times and so what? It's already empty. Uh, and by putting this, uh, and like if the user isn't logged in, uh, cleaning local storage is also fine because even if it had, uh, like it, it won't have anything in it to begin with. So in this case, th this test always gets a clean slate and login will always run after logout happened. Uh, this is a good idea like even this version of this test needs like the, the cleanup part here uh, you should do cleanup before uh, at the start of the test and not at the end regardless of other like uh, uh, ideas like page objects the way you reuse this without doing the page object is you put this in like a before each uh, block and you do like uh, a wait cleanup or whatever you want to um, clean Cool, uh, just, just a good idea. It's also a good idea for systems to assume as little as possible uh, about the state they receive and um, clean up. So um, don't put uh, clean up logic at the, at the end of the test because tests can fail, put it in the start of the test. Uh, it makes life so much easier in the long run. Uh, number seven, uh, pick good CSS selectors uh, or use something like testing that has smart locators. The reason is if you go to website, so uh, I'll just open demo test in my own. It's like a very regular React website we have for uh, demos. Uh, if you look at the CSS selectors or everything here, you will notice that everything has these weird names. Uh, this is because it's using something uh, called React and CSS modules, uh, which has changing class names. All other tools like Angular or Vue or basically everything even remotely new has changing uh, like CSS selectors. Uh, there's test hooks, but those really don't scale very easily to having multiple uh, like uh, teams working on the project. The thing that companies end up doing if they don't use smart locators is they will have like uh, the automation engineer open a Jira ticket to the developer to please add a CSS selector to some div. And then they add a CSS selector and then like half a year later it breaks because some other developer didn't know that the hook was being used uh, because they didn't run their test on CI. So uh, 
it's a, it's a burden, but you really need to pick good CSS selectors. I recommend to uh, do the thing. Uh, not rely on uh, class names uh, because class names, or, or at least like regular framework class names, uh, ask developers, or, or if you're the developer, just like add in a custom uh, attributes or test hooks. It makes life easier in the long run. Uh, tests break because of uh, this, this all the time. Another thing is don't uh, use this. As you can see, uh, there's the copy selector here. Uh, if you paste the CSS selector coming from Chrome here, it will be this very long thing. Uh, the issue with the selectors that Chrome makes is that they don't, uh, that they're very, they're designed to have a very uh, low number of false positives and a very high number of false negatives, which means that if the page changes even the tiniest bit, like let's say uh, this um, like input moves uh, from the left to the right, or the text change, or it's like here, or like whatever other reason, it won't find the element, uh, which means that uh, it's it's not a very good CSS selector. What you should do instead is you inspect the element, you find something logical about it. In this case, for example, it has a white date picker class. I guess it's it's also a bad uh, bad one because it's a Actually, it's very hard to get a good CSS selector here because this class is changing, right? It's coming from React. Uh, I can look for inputs and like find the first input on the page. Let's let's actually try, uh, and I might find it. I might find something else. Yeah. Um, so it, it looks like it found it, but it's also like input is not a good CSS selector either. So in this case, I would just like add a data attribute. So let's do um, like a data test hook equals. Uh, page departing date picker and then you said because you don't want to test the very far from production uh, you probably also want these classes to be uh, present there uh, all right go go back to the slides uh, again if you use something like testing testing has smart locators uh, so this is not an issue we select every element in thousands of ways and run um, machine learning uh, so it doesn't usually break uh, number eight uh, develop and test on the same operating system if possible. Uh, so I'll actually, let, let's do something different. So I'll go to the Chrome source code uh, just to show something. Uh, Selenium, Puppeteer, Playwright, pretty much every popular automation tool uh, uses something called the debugger to click on elements. Uh, so let's, wh when you click on an element in uh, like Selenium, it will, I'll go here real quick. It will issue an operating system level command. So uh, this, for example, is the actual C++ code that uh, Chrome uses to dispatch clicks on Mac. And just the thing I want to show here is that when you do a click on Mac, uh, let's do inject a mouse event. That's the important one. Uh, what it will end up doing is it will dispatch a native uh, Mac OS uh, command. I, I can't see the one I want, but it will be CG post. Yeah, it's this one, post mouse event. It does a CG post mouse event, which is a native operating system command. Uh, if I look at the code for uh, Linux, it's different code. If you, I look for the code uh, at Windows, it's different code. So for the very least, if you ran a test in, in your CI environment, it's probably running um, you know, in Linux and isn't working. Uh, try testing Linux locally. It might be a tiny difference in how it's uh, like different operating systems um, dispatch. Again, tools like testing normalize this, uh, but in general, it's better that to test like uh, um, to develop on Linux if your tests run on Linux. Uh, all right, number nine. Uh, your users uh, don't all use Chrome. I know it, it might seem that way sometimes, but users don't all use Chrome. Uh, unless you're an enterprise, then your users probably all use uh, IE9 or something ancient like that, uh, but just kidding. Uh, but uh, users use different operating systems. Uh, they have uh, uh, phones. It's very important to test mobile web. Uh, they have um, old uh, computers. They have uh, slow computers sometimes. Uh, and and they have uh, different versions of uh, like uh, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and other browsers. And they might make maybe the same user uses different browsers at home and, and at their work. So it's very important to test multiple browsers uh, and multiple connection speeds if possible. Uh, again, most testing tools like will let you do this. Uh, it's, just, it's, it's not a lot of extra setup. It's, it's extra setup because the website is different. Like a lot of companies neglect uh, their Safari or Firefox versions. 
uh, but it's it's actually a pretty considerable amount of people um, using your uh, website and service. So it's important to set up multiple browsers uh, for testing and uh, to run them. Uh, and number 10 is going back to uh, don't repeat yourself uh, to group actions and uh, into page and component objects uh, just to uh, show it again real quick. Uh, if I have all these ungrouped actions here, uh, I really want to put them in a logical, easy to debug place like the uh, account page object. Uh, very, uh, very simple to just group everything here. And uh, it's a lot easier to understand what's happening here in these five actions than it is here in these like uh, very complicated, I guess, um, actions. It's not very complicated either way, to be fair, but it's more uh, it's more work to read. And again, the hard part in testing is debugging them and not um, not, not writing them in the first place. Uh, writing them you can just record. It's very um, it's very easy. Uh, I want to show component objects real quick. So page objects is basically you go to the uh, page. Uh, let me go to the demo page again, and you make an account page for this. Uh, doing component uh, like a, like a component object instead of a page object means that instead of doing a, doing a page out of the whole thing, you do a component out of this thing. So in this case, instead of having an account uh, page, I'm going to do a login box component. So login box.js, and the I'm just going to cheat. Uh, so let's do a class login box. I'm gonna copy everything from account here real quick. And it, it, it's still a page object, right? I didn't change anything. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass this section. So uh, S, so constructor, uh, I'm gonna take a box parameter. It's gonna default to uh, like the one login box I know, uh, this dot box equals uh, box. And then I'm just gonna chain uh, this dot box. Uh, to all the CSS selectors. Now, uh, as you like, those of you remember, uh, like Yagni are going to say, hey, uh, you're not going to need this. You only have one login uh, on the page. And you may be right. Like, if I only have one login uh, box repeating on the page, this is not a good pattern. The thing is, a lot of companies are moving to component based uh, like um, patterns where uh, this login, uh, login box may appear multiple times in the page. And um, in, in my component system, if I'm using something like Storybook uh, or the, like have something else for the style guide where I don't have to render the whole app for the login books, uh, uh, box. So in that case, I really want to reuse uh, the different uh, login boxes in the site, like the code for the different login boxes. Again, the main reason, if this breaks, because for some reason you decide a password needs to be uh, a certain length or like they switch this around to, for some odd reason, uh, put the login on the left, and the cancel on the right, very, very mean. Um, then I don't want to have to fix a million uh, different places. Uh, and like that, that, that's the gist of it. So uh, if you can uh, group things into components, please uh, group them into components. If you can't, uh, please uh, group them into pages. And if you can't, uh, I won't blame you. I know it's a, <laughs> a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, things to think about. Uh, all right, I think that's all the tips I have. All right, we're turning it over to Paz. Paz, you uh, you're running run the slides, or is whoever's got control can just keep running from there. Winston is going to do it. Okay, so well, let me just first. <laughs> this is okay. Paz has been with us for a few months now, um, and he is our um, our new vice president of product. And um, this is his first introduction to public, you know, in this kind of marketing uh, forward. So. Thanks, thanks, Paz, for joining us here and and taking us over. And um, you guys will be hearing more from Paz over time. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, Benji, for the very interesting things. Um, so, uh, as Benji, we can move it. It's in, enough enough to see me. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so, as Benji stated. Uh, tests should be treated the, just like other code, and uh, one should follow the, the dry concept and have uh, all the logic in the code only once. 
And for that reason, we have groups in our testing test team and we develop uh, the innovative uh, features uh, of auto, auto grouping. Uh, but first, before we're talking about auto grouping, let's talk about uh, testing labs. Uh, testing labs is, uh, uh, is the home of uh, innovations and it allows early access to new cool features. Uh, it also allows uh, you as users to, to influence, influence our directions uh, in order to better fit our users' needs. And uh, for now, we have a few features in, in labs. We have uh, accessibility tests, auto grouping, and more. Um, now to auto grouping. So what is actually this uh, auto grouping? Uh, auto grouping is a new mechanism that uh, it actually reviews all your tests in, in background and uh, automatically identifies sequence of test steps that are duplicated across your test. Uh, then after the, the uh, background processes, you can just remove the duplications in your test in one click, just one click, and re replace this with a re reusable group. Um, by, uh, by, next slide, please. Uh, by uh, replacing your duplicated steps with group, uh, you get a lot of benefits. Uh, duplicates increase maintenance efforts and uh, it uh, reduces uh, stability because every app change or bug uh, in your test actually requires multiple updates in every duplicate, in every instance. Uh, using shared groups and auto-grouping will assist you in fixing duplicates easily and quickly. Um, in, in the next slide, we can see some uh, analytics and numbers regarding uh, uh, duplication, uh, step duplication. So we analyzed more than uh, 400 test projects and calculated the duplication level uh, according to the, the equation that you can see here. And we found that uh, the average duplication level is above, above uh, 80, 18%, uh, which means that almost one fifth of, uh, of the steps are duplicated and, and, uh, and they can be part of uh, shared groups. So just uh, imagine how much effort can be saved by handling these duplications and replacing them with one shared group. Um, now, now I'm going to, to, to do a quick walkthrough for the auto grouping feature. Um, after selecting the auto grouping screen in our testing, uh, testing app, uh, you will see the list of, uh, of all the auto grouping suggestion. It includes, as we can see here, I hope you can see my mouse. Uh, it includes the number of duplicated steps and the number of te testing groups. Uh, that the steps appear at. Here you can see it. Uh, after selecting one suggestion, you can see the list of tests right here uh, that include the duplicated steps. Uh, by, uh, by selecting a specific uh, such test, uh, we can see it in the, in the next uh, slide. Uh, you will see here, you can, you can see, we can see that the preview of the steps, including the duplicated steps, which are a uh, which which have a gray frame. Okay, you can see here you have this is the duplicated steps, and this all this is the the, the steps of your test. This test, um, you can choose which uh, which test you want to replace the duplicated steps uh, with the new group, and press the create shared group button. Okay, you can select the test, and then for them create a shared group. Next slide, please. Okay, now you just need to supply some very simple information like the name of the new group, uh, in, in which br branch you wanted to create it, and uh, in case the group involves parameters, uh, the name of the parameters. And that's it. Now, now you have clean tests after you're doing, after you, you, after you did all this process, you have clean tests that can be easily maintained. I, I can take them through this, Paz. So, um, so let me just summarize really quickly what we talked about. So first of all, you know, tests are code and, I'm sorry, tests are code, they're designed to test other code, but sometimes those tests are disguised, you know, so even though we say tests are code, a lot of times they, they show up as 
um, you know, codeless tests. And codeless tests are really just, you know, a visual representation of code that's behind the scenes. And so some of the same principles apply. And that's why Benji's 10 tips for designing tests like a developer are useful in helping you to think through the architecture of your test design, whether you're designing it in some uh, open source framework that's using code or you're designing it in a, in a visual editor like Testin's visual editor. Now, we don't mean to say that, that all duplication is bad. Uh, as Benji talked about, there's, there's a little bit of an art involved in deciding on how um, you know, how you, you balance the difference between, you know, maintainability and understandability of the test. But there's also a cost when you have these duplicates. So, you know, eliminating the duplicates does allow you, I mean, having those duplicates does uh, result in some increased maintenance. And that, that comes in the fact that when you do have an update, application update, the application, um, you know, all the tests that, that, that are duplicate would have to be updated as well. Uh, same thing with stability. If you have, uh, you know, a, a bug in one of those steps that is duplicated multiple times, and you have to fix it in every test, so there are some costs there that just impact your maintenance and cause you to, um, you know, spend more time maintaining and less time actually focusing on, you know, increasing your test coverage or or doing other things. Now, um, auto grouping that that Pause covered really quickly is a new feature. It's it's available in labs for now. Um, We'll, we'll release it more generally down the road, um, date yet to be determined. But what it does is it looks across all your projects and it does the, or all your tests in your project, and it does it as an offline or background process. So it's not like in the process of uh, you know creating a test or anything. And then it'll give you the results. And, and then when you wanna do some test architecture cleanup, you can look at all those duplicates and decide what what makes sense to eliminate and replace with the group and, and which ones you're willing to um, to live with with the potential maintenance costs. Now, I will say that, um, you know, when you're thinking about creating more groups, one thing that you can do to help with your understandability is, is use descriptive names for those groups so that it becomes really clear what that group is doing. And, um, you know, we, we see some of our customers that have, you know, big use of groups, you know, they use lots of groups. They become very easily understood when you look at the um, the test editor. So you'll see, you know, like there's the initial step that that reaches out to the, um, you know, to the uh, the login step, or there's the initial um, the first step, and then you'll see a group, and then you'll see another group. But those groups are aptly named. So the one group is named, you know, login step. It's very clear what that next step is doing. The next step might be, um, you know, a search function. And if you know that you're doing that as, uh, you know, consistently across your different tests, it becomes really clear to everybody who's looking at that test. And then you focus your individual test steps on those things that are unique to that particular function that you're testing at that point in time. So with that said, uh, I think we're, we're um, ready to take any questions if there are any questions and if not then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up so I'll give just um, I don't know if we can open it up to to verbal questions or I guess we'd you know type your question in I, I can there's one question um, how to how to design test case using page object design pattern in testum uh, Benji I'm muted uh, so basically in testing it's very easy you have groups groups are built in and groups are like page objects in testing and if you want component objects we have it's called um, we have something that's called group context that lets you do that uh, but basically groups in testing are like uh, um, page objects in like code full automation tools uh, worth mentioning that there are very interesting features coming up in terms of uh, mm -hmm. test organization i'm not sure if like we it's, it's public yet but it will get even better um in the near future okay another question um what is the criteria for auto grouping uh pause do you want to try to take that one uh, yes uh, actually for now, we are just looking for the same steps. Uh, we're looking for the same step to the longer, the longer sequence of steps uh, in in the groups. Um, we are going to to make it more and more sophisticated, uh, so we will be able also to 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 treat 
two steps that are identical, for example, tab or click, which actually perform the same operation and to combine them together as, as one step, although it's not uh, totally uh, identical. Um, in addition, we want also to, to, to insert more logic of combined steps, which are part of one functional uh, uh, model, model or, uh, or any, any, anything that makes sense uh, functional wise. I hope it answered the question. Okay, and another question. Um, what if the locators are different, but the steps are the same? So, so again, in case in case the locators are different, then we we don't want to group uh, the same uh, the st same steps. So it's not the identical steps. And again, later on, we're going to to add more and more. Uh, uh, sophistication into the system to be able to identify that even the, the even in case the, the locators are not exactly the same in case they uh, refer to the same object then we can treat it as a as the same object okay next question um, would it be possible to get the analytics you mentioned for our project this is uh, it would be interesting to know how many duplications we have and might lead us to change our working procedures. So for now, we do not publish the the, the exact number of uh, of each project. However, you can contact your uh, customer success person, and they will be happily share share this information with you. And uh, you can also try and 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 work with the auto grouping, uh, and then you can again contact your customer success person and you can see whether the number was a uh, what's the updated number and in order to to reach the goal of a uh, minimum uh, duplicated steps okay and another question what if you need different groups for the various branches uh, for now actually every in every branch we have uh, all, all of the suggestions are cal calculated for the master branch, and however, for uh, in case you 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 are you you insert you enter a specific branch, then the, the suggestion will be filtered and only the relevant suggestion will be displayed for the specific branch. So you can do all the you can get all the suggestion for a specific branch, merge it to the master. And then again, we're going to run the auto grouping process again and give you more and more suggestions. Hey, can I just add one thing there is um, we did re release uh, um, what we call conflict resolution in the merging of branches. And so if you do decide that you know you want to try auto grouping it, and it creates it in a new branch and then you want to merge it back in, you get to go at a granular level and decide if that step is something you want to merge back in. So, you, you know, you can create a new branch um, with the new groups, and then when you're merging back in, you have that level of granularity to decide whether that's a group that you want to merge back into that test or not. Okay, uh, another question. Does Tustum support data-driven framework reading data from Excel files with multiple sheets? You, you want me to take this, Paz? Go ahead. Okay, so th there are several types of test data. Uh, you can have, like in CLI runs, you have a config file. Uh, the config file is just like regular Node.js code. Uh, so if you can read it from uh, Node.js, you can feed it as test data uh, for testing. Uh, so for example, the, like the, the regular flow would be you would use the UI test data uh, feature uh, which, by the way, you can use automatically by you can just drag um, like CSV files into and use that for like uh, when developing the tests. And then you would use the config file in the testing CLI uh, to open the Excel uh, file with whatever library uh, you like for Excel. Uh, there's a few good ones. And then feed the data in whatever format you want into testing. So basically, the answer is yes, uh, testing supports that. 
Okay, another question we had is, uh, I can answer this one, uh, or can we share these slides? Um, I believe the answer is yes, and we'll also, uh, this, this webinar will be posted publicly uh, once it is uh, completed, so you'll also be able to reference this video. Uh, let's see, we have a couple more questions. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, one, uh, steps should be the same, but the locators uh, could be different. Could you clarify? Yes, actually, for now the steps should be identical. Uh, only, only, par only parameters such as string, uh, set, uh, set text, or, or such. It can be dif can be uh, different in, in two identical two steps that should be identical as part of the same group. Um, uh, as I said later on, we may add additional heuristics about uh, about locators and whether they are, they point to the same element, even if not exactly the same. So it will come later on. For now, the steps should be identical. Okay, and this was a earlier question that I missed. Uh, what if various modules have similar steps, but they are not identical? Uh, what happens in that scenario? Again? Did I just ask that one? Sorry, I, <laughs> sorry, that's a repeat. Um, I sc scratch that. Uh, there's a question from Kathy about um, the group organization and how we came up with uh, th that system. Um, uh, she mentions they're, they're only organized alphabetically and she doesn't see a way to associate groups for a specific function. Can we talk about that? About organize, organize the, the, the shared steps, the groups? Uh, yeah, the, the question is they're, on, they're only organized alphabetically and she doesn't see a way to associate groups for a specific function. Okay, so soon we are going to, to have an option to arrange the groups and the shared steps in, uh, in folder hierarchy. So you will be able to, to arrange it as you want according to component or whatever. Okay, and then um, another question that we got is, what if you move a test from a master branch that has the auto group but then you move it to a branch that is that is not in the master branch. In case you have a test in in a branch that uh, do not appear does not appear in the in the master. For now, we are not calculating the the auto grouping for it. So you need to uh, merge it to the master, and then uh, and then we can calculate the calculate the auto grouping and uh, and have suggestion regarding this uh, test. Keep in mind that uh, if you have that you don't need to wait for the auto grouping in order to create groups, you can also create it while cre while creating the test, and also after that you can group specific steps together and create a group. So auto grouping is just a, a solution uh, afterwards, after your tests are uh, created and you have a lot of tests with many duplicated steps, uh, you have a many other options to, to avoid the du duplications. Um, but anyway, in the master, the auto grouping will be uh, available and it will run on it. Thanks, Paz. And then going back to an earlier question, um, one of our attendees would like a little clarification. Uh, the original question, Benji, this is for you. Uh, the question was originally, does Testum support data-driven framework reading data from an Excel file with multiple sheets? Uh, you addressed that, uh, but, but one attendee would like clarification. Um, can, can you, can you uh, state your answer specifically addressing Excel? Like does Excel, does Testum support that, uh, the, 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 that function with Excel? Uh, sure, I'm not sure how to. Sorry, we lost you for a second, Benji. Uh, I think we, we lost your audio. I think, sorry, I, 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 I tried to share my screen just to show like the config file, but for some reason it cut off my audio. 
Uh, so I will just post the link in the chat to the uh, config file uh, to everyone. Um, I'm not sure how to send the chat. I'll, I'll, I'll just send it uh, to Winston and he will distribute it. Uh, so basically, the config file will let you run code before and after every test is run, and on, or before all tests are run. Uh, there is a library in JavaScript, in Node specifically, uh, called uh, Excel.js that lets you read and write uh, like Excel files, and specifically like tell tell an Excel file, hey, open the second sheet and get the data from it as a CSV. Uh, with Excel.js, uh, you would just like say read the second um, file, and then uh, in testing you can feed the tests in the config file uh, using the uh, before before suite and after suite and before test and after test hoops uh, to feed it um, the data from Excel. Uh, we have seen like we have several customers do it, so I, I know for sure it's possible. Uh, I don't have like the the exact code, but it's basically. Uh, you pass like a dash dash config to the testing CLI. You um, re return uh, whatever test data you want from the uh, before test hook or before suite hook in an array, and then it will just feed the data to all your tests. Okay, and then I think we have time for one more question. Um, this is a, a, a question about a, a feature that um, uh, one of our attendees is interested in. Is there a way to organize our most commonly used commands to a special section uh, so that I don't have to keep scrolling down uh, to use something like, quote, wait for element visible. I, I, I think Paz mentioned it, but uh, yeah, okay. So uh, I'll let Paz talk about it. Can, can you ask again, please? Yeah, so uh, is there a way to organize most commonly used commands to a special section so that I don't have to keep scrolling down so far to use something like wait for element visible. Okay, so for now we don't have it. However, you can search for the specific uh, command so you don't need to scroll. You just search for it in the plus menu and then you can add whatever you you want in a, in a very quick manner. Okay, I think that's all of our questions. Um, Sean, do you wanna close us out? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, don't have uh, anything else to say. I really appreciate you guys joining. And like um, Winston said, we'll be able to post these um, on the, the test and web under webinars in, in a couple of days. So the, the replay will be out there. And um, yeah, we didn't plan on posting the slides, but we can, we can also add a link to the slides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.